Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougall's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougall. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougall. And tonight, just like every night, I'm going to try to get through as many questions as possible. But first, I'd like to say hello to you, mom and dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. How are you? Hi. Well, good. Good. Nice of you to put the air. Yeah, go. <laughs> well, Heather, I'm just fine. And uh, every Sunday night at five o'clock Pacific time, we'll get together and try and answer as many questions as possible. But um, anyway, I'm going to answer some a lot of <laughs> questions tonight. So you guys listen carefully, okay? But first, I wanted to start out by telling you, I run into a couple of situations. One a relative and one a close friend who are now frightened to death about dying and because they've had some medical problems. And both of them, I'm trying to deal with the fact that they need to slow down. You know, one person, they we're dealing with an issue of cancer. And I've tried to explain as I've told all you folks, from the time cancer develops until you can find it, it takes 10 years on average. Why be rushed next week into having some of your body cut out or apart? You know, that was one interaction. I said, you know, you got time to think about this. Not, not forcing into having one of your body parts cut out, especially since curing cancer by surgery is, you know, virtually impossible when it comes to major organ cancer. It's already spread. I mean, it's good God, it's a 10 year old disease. That ought to give you at least a day or two to think about it, what you <laughs> ought to do. And then the other one, another one is a relative who, you know, is having a lot of trouble with, well, you know, she's almost my age, having trouble with her breathing. We had a, a meeting this afternoon and, you know, hot shot from Mayo Clinic is telling us what to do. And a couple other hot shot doctors that are also <laughs> relatives are putting their point of view in and they all make it such a complex issue. I finally got to the point where I said to the, the, the specialist, I said, you know, you sound like you're giving a new time medical conference, not taking care of a patient. And, and you know, the, the discussion went to the point where it was talking about the poor person, a relative of mine is like two toes from death. <laughs> and we got an hour into the conversation. I asked all the, let's see, one, two, three, four doctors in this conversation. And one nurse. And one nurse. And I said, wait a minute. Look I at, wasn't the nurse. <laughs> look at the patient. You guys are describing somebody that's about ready to walk into their casket. This person is not sick. Look at her. And they all stepped back and said, well, I guess we don't have to be all that complicated with all these tests and do all these wonderful things that you know, because you told me that it's not going to help anyway. So why why paint such a dismal picture? They had no right doing that. Well, that's what bothered me the most yeah. because they were talking about all this, God. all these complicated things that they could do to her. Well, you could. They can do a lot to you. Yeah. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, the medical profession can do a lot to you, and they talk about it, and they plan it, and they plot it. And they study it and they figure out ways to make money off of it. And they never ask. And once in a while, <laughs> once in a while, the patient ends up better off than they would have if they wouldn't have gotten the treatment. But unless you stop and ask, okay, doc, you're ordering tests on me that are expensive and inconvenient and potentially dangerous. You're recommending treatments that are inconvenient, expensive, and potentially dangerous. Do you have evidence that you're going to do me more good than harm? They didn't, they don't, and I guarantee you for most of you with chronic problems, they don't. Just ask that question. Ask for the evidence. Don't let them bamboozle you. Don't let them talk like, like they're some kind of over-the-top expert and know everything and have every solution to every problem like they believe that they want you to believe. They don't. Anyways, I had to get to this involved in a very, very close friend and a relative who has been pushed around by well, well-meaning medical doctors, all I can say. All right, I'm ready for some questions, Heather. I won't go on. Just to have it happen a couple hours ago, and I wanted to tell my, my friends out there that, you know, I really, really, really worry for you that you don't have an advocate on your side to just ask, will this do me more good than harm? Now, what's and, it going to do for me? 
Yeah, and what do I? What, how am I going to suffer? And what do I have to pay for it? And what are you asking me to do? And they expect you to just lay down and take it. You better not. You're getting hurt. Anyway, questions. <laughs> Let's do a rapid fire. You got a whole bunch of questions. I got a whole bunch of answers. Oh, good. Okay. First one. This is from Rebecca. Can you please explain gout and a plant-based diet? Okay. Well, gout gout has to do with uh, a, um, a a molecule. They're called purines. They're uh, organic compounds. And what where organic compounds is they come from genetic material. Where does genetic material come from? DNA and RNA. It comes originally from the sperm and the egg that got together and decided to make you. All right. So each and every cell has DNA in it. That DNA breaks down into purines. Cells that have more protein in them, like animal cells, break down to more purines. Purines turn into uric acid. Uric acid gets into the fluid in the joints and it forms crystals. And these little crystals, they jab into your joint tissues, cause horrible inflammation, pain, redness, gout. Often occurs in the great toe on either foot, but it can occur in, in many, many joints. How do you diagnose it? You don't diagnose it with a blood test. No, you can measure uric acid in the blood and it's done routinely and very inexpensively, but that's not how it's diagnosed, a gouty arthritic condition. You take a needle, you stick it in the joint, you suck it out, you take it to the microscope, you look under the microscope and you look for these gouty crystals. Okay, so where are you more likely to have a whole bunch of purines build up? Well, that has to do with, uh, with, with cells that make a lot of protein. Now, what cells do you think make a lot of protein? I mean, go to the grocery store. Come on, <laughs> what do they tell you? 30% more protein. Protein, the, the genetic material used to synthesize Protein, the RNA, breaks down into purines, which results in uric acid, which gets into the joints that causes the pain. So how do you think you prevent it? And you can prevent it nearly 100% of the time. There's only rare uh, recessive conditions, uh, homozygous conditions, like occur in like one in 10,000 people, where you would get gout on a healthy diet. Otherwise, you have to eat foods that are high protein, Remember, the protein is made from RNA and DNA, which is the genetic material that make a lot of protein. So they have lots of genetic material. So they turn lots of, make lots of purines. These are just chemicals. You want to learn about it? Just look it up on the internet. That turns into uric acid. So you stop eating the animals. Gout will not exist on the McDougal diet. Period. Well, it, 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 when you first change over, some people oh. get gout. Oh, yeah. Well, that's those of you who have been building up purines. You see, the uric acid, it gets in the muscles and the fat and all kinds of tissues. And so when you change your diet, anything, anything that causes you to lose weight, the Atkins diet, wearing your teeth together, prisoner of war, anything that causes you to lose weight causes the fat to dissolve out of your fatty tissues, which releases uric acid. So commonly on any weight loss program, including ours, how common, I've seen it maybe in four cases in 12,000 people over my career. What happens is you will precipitate a gouty attack when you change your diet and lose weight. How do you deal with this? Well, you get a gouty attack. Ain't no big deal. You take a little bit of colchicine, which has been used for hundreds of years, relatively safe, uh, get a little nausea, vomiting, diarrhea from it, but it stops the painful attack colchicine does. And you take it at a certain regime, and if you get a gouty attack, your doctor will tell you what to do. Take it every hour, up to 12 hours, et cetera. So the pain goes away. So you just take some colchicine, it goes away. All right, so you say, well, I might get another attack. How do I prevent it? It'll be just terrible, I'm an airline pilot. I can't afford to get a gouty attack when I'm flying coast to coast. What am I going to do? I don't, I can't get an attack and I'm in this McDougal diet and I'm losing weight. What am I going to do? Well, I put you on a little colchicine once a day for about six months. And by that time, you'll have mobilized all the uric acid that would precipitate a gouty attack. Okay, this is a disease of royalty, of aristocrats, of kings and queens, of eating all kinds of animal foods. That's how you get it. I don't think it's related to alcohol. You're often told this, don't think so. That's my, my quick take on that. <laughs> what do you think, Heather? 
That was yeah. great. You covered all the points. 100% preventable, easily treatable. And some of the uh, drugs that are given when it comes to gout or uric acid kidney stones are pretty darn toxic. So you better really ask the question, well, will this do me more good than harm if I take this? Just change your darn diet. Just stop poisoning yourself. <laughs> Just to review for people who may be new to this session, five o'clock every Sunday night Pacific time, we're here YouTube live. The McDougall diet is the diet that I believe is correct for human beings, which will allow you to look, feel, and function your best. It's a diet based on starch. It's common starches are things like corn, rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, wheat, et cetera. Those are starches. They have lots of calories, plenty of protein, lots of vitamins and minerals. They're just perfect. They're the food that 99.99% of the people ever walk this earth have consumed. And you have a little fruit and vegetable. Can you eat animal foods? Hey, if you're over 21, you know, you have, you do whatever you damn please. Are they good for you? Well, you know, the body's tough. You could probably tolerate a few, but not a lot. I mean, I know not a lot. I look at the American population or the population of Western society. When 80% of people are sick, look out on the streets. You know that we can't tolerate much rich food. A little. Not a lot. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's what I wanted to say. For those of you who are new, it's a, just a simple, simple approach <clears throat> of taking you off food poisons, which are animal foods and oils, and putting you on the most delicious, most effective, most inexpensive diet that you can imagine. It cures most, almost all problems due to dietary causes. Starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Why do I know this? I spent the last 50 years learning and practicing it. Believe me. If you don't believe me, put me to the test. Put me to put me to the test. Give me 12 days of your life. Of course, you'll have to get somebody to take you off all your drugs. Because I know you're on a pile of drugs. I know you are. And most doctors aren't aren't educated to do that. You know, they're afraid to do that. They get criticized. It's maybe we're sued. But sick people take drugs. Healthy people don't. Which leads me to the one or two ads or three ads that I'm going to give during this hour. You should really think about going to our website and learning the McDougal program for free. It's free. You spend a few days doing it, a few weeks, whatever it takes you. Or you could join us on our 12-day internet-based program, which we service people all over the world. And you know, our, our medical doctor and our support specialists, our dietitian and trichologists and so on, will get you over the humps. 12 days, we're running around in May. Uh, on to the next question, Heather. That's gonna be fast. Okay, next one. This uh, Karen wrote in and she stopped using iodized salt. Uh, it's been about five or six months and she tested her iodine and it was low at 38. So now she's worried, wondering what she should do. She's got kelp. Um, she wants to add dulse granules. I don't know why I've never tested for iodine in the blood. Is this a hair sample? I mean, is somebody trying to sell her iodine supplements? I don't understand. Well, and, she's worried. And that. what's 38? I mean, we're, we're looking at a thyroid function test. These are measured in, in micro-international units. Well, she so, did get a TSH test, and it was 4.5. Okay, well, see, that, I understand that test. I don't understand a iodine of 38. I, maybe it's probably because I'm just not aware of what, to, what that particular measuring. But a TSH of 4.5 is fine. I mean, it's not ideal. It'd be better maybe to be two. But it's unlikely it's due to iodine deficiency. It's most likely due to an autoimmune problem, which every, di every doctor that sees you is going to tell you the same darn thing. They're going to tell you you have autoimmune th thyroiditis. Autoimmune thyroiditis, which means your body has attacked your thyroid thyroid gland, and some of your gland is destroyed. It's gone. All the thyroid in the world is not going to fix it. All the iodine in the world is not going to fix that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know why you're measuring your iodine or chasing it around, and if you decide you need iodine, then take it. It's not going to hurt you. I don't know of any, any poisoning from iodine problems. So, you know, but you want to, what you want to do is work on, on the TSH level, thyroid stimulating hormone. Ideally, it's two, four ain't bad, I probably would encourage you to take thyroid medication, but if you know we had a conversation, you said, "Look, I'd like to try it, see if I feel better, 
and I'll see if. Well, but her question was: Should she be taking iodine? Well, no. If we're using iodine salt, would that make her? Not making any difference. No. Oh, okay. It's not going to change your TSH level. Because likely your problem is not due to iodine deficiency. Now, if you were living in the United States around the Great Lakes in the 1920s, I would suspect iodine deficiency because they had the Great Goiter, goiter Belt then, when 20% of the people had goiters. 20%. They even tested and showed IQ changes in children because of the lack of iodine. But that's not a problem these days. So if you want to cover all bases, you know, take a little iodine. Fine. I don't know why you would or wouldn't, but likely the problem is not due to iodine deficiency. And if it hasn't been corrected by taking the iodized salt or the iodized whatever you're taking, then your TSH hasn't come down, then you know that's not the problem. If this problem is likely solved if it is a problem, which I'm not sure it is, by taking a, a, a synthroid, which is a, a thyroid supplement, a hormone supplement. I don't know. Maybe I don't have the question right, Heather, but that, that's the best I can tell you. Oh, I think that's a good answer. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Baby A. They're wanting to know how long it takes for insulin resistance to become insulin sensitive. Uh, hours. <laughs> the body starts to heal within hours. Uh, you will have to end up getting down to trend body weight before you corrected all of the insulin resistance. Because you know, as I've tried to explain to you, uh, type 2 diabetes is an adaptation. It's not a disease. It's an adaptation from consuming too many calories, too much fat. You end up gaining 20, 30, 40 pounds, and the body says, look, that's enough. And it's insulin that stuffs fat into fat cells. So instead of ending up 100, 200, 300 pounds overweight, your cells become insensitive to the insulin so that you don't gain past 30, 40, 50 pounds. That's why it happens. And so when you lose the weight, the body no longer has to invoke this adaptive mechanism to keep you from being 500 pounds, which you could be if you didn't develop insulin resistance. And I've seen probably two dozen people in my career that weighed like six, eight, 700 pounds. And they didn't develop insulin resistance, you know, whereas the rest of the people do. And they, the insulin doesn't work, doesn't stop fat into fat cells. You don't get to be extremely fat, which is dangerous. But because it doesn't work, because you have insulin resistance, the sugar doesn't go into the regular cells, stays in the blood. So you get a blood test and your blood sugar is elevated. The problem is to get the insulin to work well again. So the sugar goes in the cells so that you don't require extra, or you don't require this adaptation, which just such, shuts down sensitivity to insulin. So it, it starts right away. When you hit the trim body weight, your insulin resistance will be gone. 100% of the time, 100% 100% of the time. You know, I, I don't know why it's so hard to understand. You know, the body wants to survive and it will do all kinds of things that counteract your your abuse. And if you're going to eat enough fat and calories to end up 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight, you're going to develop type 2 diabetes. You know, 50, 40, somewhere 14 percent of the people in the United States have type 2 diabetes, frank type 2, and half or over half have prediabetes, which means they're just a few pounds from being frankly diabetic and getting in the medical business and getting treated with all kinds of powerful drugs that lower your sugar, but make you sick and kill you. Oh, you don't believe that. You don't believe that they will kill you. Why don't you take the trouble to go to our, our website and look up the articles on diabetes and then take into your doctor. Pick into your doctor the six studies that have been done to look at the aggressive treatment of type two diabetes with pills and shots. There are six of them. That's all just six. And they all show the same thing. They show an increase in risk of heart disease and death. Three published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, the Advance, the Accord, and the Veterans Study, all published the same year, show, well, for the Advance Study, or excuse me, the Accord Study, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute had to intervene. And they stopped the study 17 months early because of an increased risk in death 
and heart disease among those who are aggressively treated. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> you can look up these studies and go in and ask the doctor, is this true? And of course, I encourage you to get the whole picture, listen to the entire lecture that I did on diabetes. It's free, it's on YouTube, or you read the entire articles that I've written. But nobody challenges me on this, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So, All they say is nobody could do that. Well, what they what they say is this is what we all do. This is the standard practice of medicine. This is the community standard. If I don't practice like all the other guys and gals down the street practice, I could get sued, even if it's the right thing to do for patients. Even if you take a patient. Well, anyway, let's talk to you. Next question. <laughs> let's see, next question. This is from NYCAC. They were wondering if you still believe that milk causes osteoporosis. Well, I, I know it doesn't prevent it. Okay. Uh, dairy products are the most acidic of all food. Cheese. Uh, cheese. Let me say that real again. Uh, cheese is the most acidic of all foods. Uh, Milk is a little bit alkaline, but cheese is the most acidic of all foods. Uh, we know that consuming dairy does not, or calcium, does not reduce the risk of hip fractures because there have been, well, two major reviews on it. And of course, they're published in my work. I've showed you, I've got the references there. You can read them. And they show country by country, the more calcium consumed, the more hip fractures. So that, you know, to sort out whether it's milk or calcium pills, you know, most of it is food calcium sources. Um, it's the acid that does, causes the bones to dissolve, which weakens the bones. The bones dissolve to make alkaline material to neutralize the dietary acids from the meat and the cheese. So do I believe I know that milk does not, does not in any way uh, discourage osteoporosis and does it cause it? I don't think I've ever said that. I think what I've said is milk is one of the foods that contributes to the cause of osteoporosis. Well, how about fish? Yeah, yeah, fish does too. How about beef? Oh yeah, beef too. And, and maybe chicken? Yeah, yeah, chicken's very acidic too. And how about isolated soy protein? You know, like you get in the, in the fake meats. Oh yeah, that does it too. That's, that's really acidic too. <laughs> anyway, your starches are alkaline potatoes, sweet potatoes, et cetera, except for, not getting into more detail than I should, grains <laughs> and legumes. They're slightly acidic, but not so much the body can't handle it. So I would have to say that you're being too, too specific when you say, when you ask if I said that milk causes osteoporosis. It's one of the foods that contributes to it. And certainly taking in dairy does not, does not correct the problem. Well, people are used to hearing milk um, promote strong bones or something like that. They don't say that anymore, though. Don't they? No, 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 oh, okay. no, no, because the data is so <laughs> overwhelming that it doesn't. Dairy industries, you know, they're a big business. They act like any other business. They've got the uh, they've got the National Dairy Council and a whole bunch of other organizations, state by state, country, you know, country by country, that support the interests of agribusiness. They're interested in making sure the farmers are doing well. So they get together a whole bunch of money and they try and tell you that you should be consuming their products. They're not interested in whether you are healthy or not. They're interested in selling food. Grow up. <laughs> okay, next question. Anthony wants to know if you think beans are the superfood of all starches because of their high fiber content. Well, they're the super gas food. <laughs> It's because they have a couple of sugars, which are fibers. I mean, fiber is non-digestible sugar. Okay, they're chains of sugar, glucoses that are put together in linkages that you can't break down in your gut. So we call that dietary fiber. Whereas starch are sugars that are attached by linkages that we can digest. So uh, beans have a couple of sugars that are notorious that make gas. That makes them, that's probably their best reputation. I would, I would say that beans can be a more satisfying starch because they're really solid and bulky. And people who are just starting the program, they're looking for this kind of sensation. So we often recommend uh, you know, that you, you include some bean dishes in your diet for that sense of satiety until you adjust. 
uh, they're high in protein, they're 30% protein. Fortunately, they're vegetable protein, so the hazards are minimal from having this protein. In fact, they're probably, well, I don't know. The reason I don't know is because the research hasn't really been done. They've, they've certainly taken isolated vegetable protein and shown that it, it hurts the bones, causes bone loss, isolated vegetable protein. But they've never done the research that says that eating a bunch of beans, peas, lentils is going to do the same thing. They never will either. Well, I don't, probably not. So not, not much, but I wouldn't worry about it. I, if you look at my books that I, again, I started writing many years ago, it's been 40 some years, you'll see that um, I've always identified beans, peas, and lentils with a caution sign. You look at my book, The McDougal Plan, it actually has little icons that over every recipe that when they have beans, peas, and lentils, they have a, a, a symbol for high protein because I wanted people to be aware that these are high protein foods that you need to be careful about. Not that you need to focus on getting more of, you only need to focus on getting less <laughs> because the protein is, uh, it, it can be quite toxic. You only need a little protein. After that, you gotta, you gotta, I don't metabolize it. That's a lot of work on the kidneys and the liver. So I, I don't know. I don't know where that question came from, but I liked it. <laughs> okay, thank I, you. I, Next, oh, go ahead. A cup a, a cup a day is a, a good general recommendation of cooked beans, peas, and lentils for most people, unless you have kidney liver disease, kidney or liver disease, or osteoporosis of kidney stones, which are high protein related problems. Which I would encourage to eat less than one cup cooked a day of beans, peas, and lentils. A good re general recommendation. People with kidney disease and liver disease, and they got to really, really, really cut back. In fact, I'll often add sugar to their diet so that they can get calories without protein. I know, sounds strange, doesn't it? But my patients get well, theirs don't. Thank you. Next question. This is from Chad. And if I remember correctly, he's lost a, a bunch of weight following the McDougal program. And he has a question. On the maximum weight loss program, I adhere to the 50-50 plate rule, but I regularly eat more than the recommended amount of calories. How am I still able to lose weight this way? I understand. I, 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 never, I never made a recommended portion or recommended number of calories. I never did that. I haven't done that in 50 years, 47 years. Where did all of a sudden I start recommending that you come well, back? They're, they're, they must be talking about what other people recommend that you take in for a, the amount of well, calories. You if take. you're listening to other people, then listen to other people. Don't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> your, your appetite, your hunger drive, your correctly sized stomach, your proper brain and hormones are going to take care of making sure you don't get in too many calories or too few. If you get in too few, you'll be hungry. If you get in enough or too many, you'll be satisfied. That's the way it works. So I, I don't understand why you bother keeping counting calories. Stop it. <laughs> you know, I mean, people haven't done it for a million years. Why are you doing it all again? All again? Just counting calories. And people eat until they're full. But back in the old days, what'd they live on? Starch. Corn in Central America and Mexico, remember, they're the people of the corn. We saw, we saw a statement as a, uh, uh, a Spanish statement. I wish I could remember. You can't, can you? No, but so, Heather, Heather remembered it. You, what does it, Heather, what does it say? No, no what? Remember? Oh, no, no maíz, no país. No, no maíz, no país. That's right. Get it, folks? No maíz, no, you get it. No <laughs> corn, no country. No corn, no person. That's how important starch is in various societies up until 150 years ago when somebody got the idea that I want to be just like a king and a queen. I want to be like an aristocrat. I want to eat the king's table. And then what they did is they ended up eating foods not intended for a human being. Uh, foods that maybe up until modern times, maybe a few thousand people ate. They were known as royalty, kings and queens, aristocrats. They gave up the starch, let the, let the people who are building the pyramids and toiling in the fields live on starch. They got to do all the work. Me, I'll just sit on my fat butt in this chair with my gout-inflicted foot and be sick. <laughs> and order the other people around. Don't order the other people around. Isn't that great? 
so um I don't know, what was the question no mice no pice <laughs> no it was about the 50 50 plate and why is oh yeah to stop counting calories will you please know that my goodness you have to relate look, look, listen even today when particularly more than 40 years ago before 1980 but even today you can see populations where there could be you know 100 200,000 people present in a town square and nobody's overweight where can you see that today north korea except for the one guy who's on top you know that guy he's he, he decides he's not going to eat like his his country did You see what happened. <laughs> now you unleash that power to eat that rich food on a whole population. You ready for the next question? Yeah, I'm ready. I have so many I can't get I can't get through them all. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you through all your questions, Heather. No, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> Okay, um, from Heart of Noah, what causes dandruff and hair loss when on this program? Well, I don't know. I don't, I, I, especially the dandruff part. Uh, but I've had so many people tell me that they don't have dandruff problems or even earwax problems. I've had people tell me that when they change their diet. So, you know, I have to believe it's the food. <laughs> as far as hair loss goes, um, See, how's my hair looking? <laughs> hair loss. And I'm, and I'm almost 76, folks, and I still have a few hairs to brag about. As far as the hair loss goes, uh, I'd have to either tell you the story about Dr. Anaba. And that's a long story, but you can read about it in the McDougal's, the McDougal program, 12 Days to Deny Anamic Health. You can summarize it quickly. Oh, okay, I'll summarize it quickly. Dr. Anaba, and I I found out about this because uh, one of my friends who liked to tease me, a dermatologist, Dr. Hunter, he brought me this magazine, Oncology and uh, Oncology and Hematology. Uh, yeah. We don't need to know. Anyway, he brought me this magazine, had an article by Dr. Anaba. It said, can you grow your hair back? Okay. He's even written a whole book about this. And Dr. And I thought it was a joke. So Dr. Nava tells this story about how prior to World War II, there was no male pattern baldness in Japan, zero. And then what he said is he said, after the war, when people changed their diet, you know, from primarily a rice-based diet to the rich Western diet, or at least some faction of it, that they started losing their hair. And then he gave the, the hormone changes that took place when you change your diet. And I said, this is really credible. I was living Right, right, right near Waikiki, okay, in Honolulu. We, we lived there 15 years, as you can tell from our little map back there. And uh, I had a chance to look at uh, older Japanese men and also the Japanese men who are Japanese Americans living in Hawaii. And of course, the dietary distinction was huge. The older Japanese males had a full set of hair. Their counterparts who had been raised on the Western diet in Hawaii or fat, bald, and greasy, just like white people or black people. Had nothing to do with race, had everything to do with their diet. So um, I think fundamental to keeping your hair is to make sure you eat a good diet. And of course, this, this you can relate to this because a lot of the hair loss products that you're sold on TV are anti-testosterone products. They're trying to get that male hormone, you know, by, by putting it on your head, Minoxidil, it's called, or by having you take it as a pill. And, uh, you know, that's somehow supposed to block the testosterone activity and keep your hair. Well, hormones have a lot to do with your hair growth because I remember when I was pregnant, yeah. I lost hair. Well, that's in the woman, yeah. When women, so, when women change their hormones, they lose hair too. Yeah. But they usually don't use a whole, I've never seen a woman lose a whole head, head of hair. No, no, but. I've seen a lot of men become thin, to say the least. But I've, I've had dozens of women, especially after they first start the McDougal diet, because you're waiting for the, the, the shoe to drop. I know I'm doing something wrong. You know, they've told me I'd get weak, I'd lose my hair, my muscles would fall apart. If I start this diet without a whole bunch of meat and dairy, they told me that. And so you're waiting for it to happen. 
So every little hair that falls out of the sink, you say, oh, Jez, I'm not eating enough meat. Well, let me tell you, uh, this is a natural occurrence that uh, happens to people. It's at about a 12 year cycle. Uh, and there's actually a name for it. I, I, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, it's not important. But, but it says it's a periodic cycle people go through, particularly women, where they lose a certain amount of hair and it grows back. And it happens particularly when you change your hormones. Like when you go through puberty, you get pregnant, you nurse, you stop nursing, your pregnancy ends, go through menopause. Then these are times when you periodically lose more hair. It's natural. It's not due to the food. In fact, eat the food will keep your hair. So I told you, <laughs> Dr. Inaba knows that. Okay, thank you. Next question. This is from uh, Titi. She has a 17-year-old son who was just diagnosed with hyperglycemia. They're not sure if it's type one or type two. Doctor said no to a plant-based diet. She's wondering what to do. You gotta get a new doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anybody who talks that way is just so far behind in their understanding about basic human nutrition. If she has a son that has hyperglycemia, then I'd be worried that this child has had some damage to the pancreas done. And the most likely cause of that is due to molecular mimicry or a autoimmune reaction that occurs between the beta casein protein in milk and the, the cells that produce insulin in the pancreas. It's where the body makes antibodies to the cow milk protein that you drank. And these antibodies aren't specific and they end up attacking the beta cells of your pancreas and they destroy them. So I suspect that this child is in the process of losing his or her pancreas, I guess to him. It takes about three to seven years to destroy an entire pancreas. So likely he's in a phase where there's still there's still plenty of pancreatic tissue left that he had in his family ought to work at preserving. In other words, I think it's crucial that they fix the diet to stop the progression of an autoimmune reaction that's killing the cells that make insulin in the pancreas. Makes no sense not to. The doctors often describe this, what you're experiencing now as a honeymoon phase. A young person, it could happen to an old person too because type 1 diabetes occurs after the age of 19 half the time. But what happens is somebody gets diabetes, they get really sick. You know, they lose a lot of you know, water, they become dehydrated, they go into ketoacidosis, they're hyperventilating, they have to end up in the emergency room in the intensive care. They're sick. This is a dangerous situation. I've sat up all night long with, with children that have had this disease titrating their insulin levels. They're in big trouble. And then what happens is they go home and all of a sudden they notice, hey, they don't need the insulin shots anymore. And then as time goes on, you pass through this honeymoon phase as enough of the cells are further destroyed. So you end up having frank diabetes. So I think you're at a phase now where you can still make a difference. And the difference you make is getting the child on the right diet, particularly off the dairy. You want to know the research, you want to read it yourself, you want to share it with your doctor, who obviously knows nothing about what a human being eats, then just go to my website, <laughs> watch my lecture on autoimmune disease, write down the articles that I cite, show them to the doctor, and then get another doctor. Anyway, I hope that's not the case. The other thing is, if I met your son, first thing I'd look at is, is the obese. Because he's a little obese, then there's a good chance that he doesn't have, or there's a, a more likely chance he doesn't have the type 1, but has the type 2 diabetes. In other words, the kind that's curable 100% of the time by weight loss. I just went through that discussion a minute ago. With the type 1 diabetes, what has happened is the insulin-producing cells are dead. Type 2 diabetes, they're working overtime. They produce as much insulin, often twice as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. It's just they're so fat. So if that's the case, and I met your son, he walked in as a patient, that I would certainly consider that highly. And then, of course, what do you do? How do you fix that problem, folks? Come on now. How do you fix the problem of childhood obesity, which occurs in about 20% of the kids? Come on now. 
You think this is normal for 20% of the children to be to be obese and 40% to be overweight and obese? Come on now, what's the answer? Well, tune in next week and I'll tell you. <laughs> you know what the answer is. The kid needs to be on the diet for human beings. That's what he needs to be on. And whether he progresses to have frank diabetes, it'll, it'll happen in the next three to six or seven years. It takes that long to destroy the whole pancreas. But you keep at it and you'll do it. Thank you. Okay, next question. Lily's wondering if there's a test that you can take to tell if you have too much salt in your body. No, not really. Not really. Um, and the reason I say that, Heather, is it gets to be kind of a, a kind of a, a medical school type, medical school student type discussion. As you see the sodium level, you know, sodium chloride is what salt is. And you measure sodium, you measure chloride, every routine blood test, basic chemistry panel. And you see a range that most people fall in, too low, too high. And what, you know, as a medical student, once in a while, you run into somebody that has too low or too high a sodium. But that isn't due to how much salt you eat. I know that's what you initially think. I know that's what the doctors initially think, but it's not. It's due to things like, for example, when you're diabetic. You run a low sodium blood test because of the blood sugar is high. So the way the machine works is it gets a little bit confused and, and it registers the amount of salt or sodium in your body as being low because the sugar is high. It's too complex for this discussion. Uh, same thing, uh, there, there are people who have diabetes insipidus where they can't hold on to their sodium. Again, this is a disease problem of the pituitary gland. This has nothing to do with discretionary salt intake. You're not gonna change the salt level in your blood by what you eat. Now, are there other clues you could have? Well, you could have edema, you know, swelling of the feet, legs. That might be an indication you're taking in too much salt. But a healthy person takes in a tremendous amount of salt without trouble at all. Let me give you some numbers. On our program, the basic diet is a half a gram of sodium. A half a gram, 500 milligrams. The recommendation for the average American is uh, 3.5 grams. That's 3,500 milligrams. That's what we're supposed to eat. Probably a good share of Americans eat around six, 7,000 milligrams or seven grams a day. Korean soldiers, you know, they were studied in, in World War II, eat 11 grams, 1,100 milligrams of sodium a day. Mm -hmm. Some of the sub-Japanese populations eat 16,000 milligrams or 16 grams of sodium a day. Their blood sodium levels are all the same. You just, you just pee the extra salt out. In a healthy body, that's all you do. When you start becoming an unhealthy person, then you run into problems with heart failure, kidney failure, you know, edema, collection of fluid in your body, and so on. Otherwise, I don't know how you'd check it. I, I suspect you got a blood test that had an abnormal sodium level. Okay, thank you. Next question. This is from OSHA. She uh, stopped all dairy products meat and chicken and now eats only vegetables and a little fruit, but she's gained five pounds and is wondering how this happened. Well, you know, Heather, sometimes people don't accurately observe or report what they really eat. Gosh, my yeah. first my first thought was her glycogen storage is depleted. She's not eating any carbohydrates. All she said was she was eating vegetables and fruit. Well, that's a good thought. That's a good thought. Yeah. And uh, well, but but the, if she was glycogen depleted, then she'd lose two pounds as the glycogen left the body and lose another four pounds of water. That doesn't equate with gaining weight. Let, let, me, let me just tell you what I think is happening. I had an experience recently where I went out, I had dinner with somebody who claims that they follow the McDougal diet strictly. Well, when we ordered avocado toast, I didn't order it, but this person did and it was swimming in oil. And when we went to a Mexican restaurant together, I ordered the whole beans with no oil. Guess what? 
This person who swears she follows the McDougal diet and isn't as thin as, thin as I suggested he or she should be, guess what? I think people don't observe carefully what they're doing. And do these oils sneak in or they just don't care or they think that the food isn't going to taste as good without the oil in it or it's just too inconvenient. I don't know. But I, honestly, Heather, you know, I'm not trying to uh, unnecessarily justify what I believe. And, and I'd offer as a worldwide picture that you can look at 2 billion Asians before 1980 and nobody was overweight. Nobody gained weight on a starch-based diet. So to get down to the bottom line, if you're just living on fruits and non-starchy vegetables, that's not the McDougal diet. The McDougal diet is starch with a little bit of fruits and vegetables, no oil, no animals. If she's, uh, so you're not on the McDougal diet. You're not getting satisfied if you don't have the starch in there. And the next thing I would ask is, you know, do you really follow the rules like we suggest? I would find it near impossible to live on a diet of non-starchy, green, yellow vegetables and fruit. I couldn't do it. I mean, you're talking about living on cabbage and celery and, and broccoli and cauliflower. What in the world? Who could live on that? So I question the questioner. You know, right, what are you trying? What are you trying to tell me that you gain weight on, on the diet I recommend when you're not following the diet I recommend? When I have seen firsthand that people who aren't as trim as I say that should be, there's a reason for it. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, no, 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 that was good. Do you have an opinion about red light therapy? No, I got that question in an email. I didn't know what it was. And I didn't bother looking it up. So I assume it's some way to treat some painful joint or something. Inflammation know. and... I doubt it. <laughs> you know, I, in my, 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 it's a scam. <laughs> Antenna goes up really easily on this, something like that. Does it make sense? You know, if, if you were getting inflammation and damage to your joints inside your body from, from the food that you're eating, does it make sense if you shined light on it that it would go away? But I'll sell you one for $59.95 <laughs> with no money back guarantee. Well, there are a lot more than that. <laughs> well, whatever it is, I would certainly do some research before I got into it. And again, I'm talking off subject. I really haven't bothered to to look up the red light therapy. But there's a sucker born every day and there's somebody out there to sell us and cheat us every time we turn around. Okay, thank you. Next question. Duh, this is from Joy. Does the starch solution help with dry eyes? Probably not, probably not. Because dry eyes would likely be due to uh, some destruction of the, uh, of the, uh, the lacrimal glands, which are in your eye, they're right up here, you know, so you make tears, which are also connected to the salivary glands, which are right there, okay? And what happens is you develop an autoimmune reaction where the body attacks the lacrimal and the salivary glands. And why does it do that? Why would the body attack the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands? Because of molecular mimicry. You look up the lecture I gave on autoimmune disease, and what you see is my explanation, which is backed by science, is that when you end up eating foreign salivary and lacrimal glands. Now, how would you eat foreign salivary <laughs> and lacrimal glands? Come on now, you guys have been listening for a long time. How do you do that? Well, when you go to a slaughterhouse, you see they, they waste nothing. The pigs and the cows, they donate their lacrimal glands and their salivary glands to the sausage. And if you're going to eat these foreign proteins, your body's going to consider them as being invaders. And it's going to make antibodies to these foreign cow and pig proteins. And it's going to find similar proteins on the cells in your body and attack them and destroy them. That's how you get autoimmune diseases. It's a little more, I'm sure it's a little more complicated than that. There are lots of, lots of systems involved, but that should be simple enough for you to take action. What can you do? Artificial tears. Got any other ideas, Mary? No, that's yeah. that's the best one because there's no way you can. Um, it won't produce. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on buying organic? 
great. I think it's a good idea, Mary and I do it, don't you, Mary? Yeah. Whenever I can. Why do you do that? Well, because I'm afraid of those little counters. <laughs> yeah. I want to buy things that have, you know, stuff sprayed all over them. I suppose you even got a water filter on your counter at home, I don't do. you? Oh my goodness, yeah. you can I... <laughs> We buy organic. You know, one of, the, one of the thoughts that comes up is the farm workers who are exposed to, you know, extreme doses of these pesticides and herbicides. So you're dealing with the farm workers who uh, who really suffer a lot from what goes on in agriculture, and these things cause brain damage. You know, organophosphates, pesticides, are linked to serious brain damage. And also Parkinson's disease. Look it up. You got time? It's, it's only it's you know you, you got all the rest of the evening. Look it up. Look up Parkinson's disease and pesticides or organophosphates and see what you find. So yeah, we buy organic. But as Mary said, you know if it becomes an issue, it's, it's not really not never a cost issue for us. But that's beside the point. If it became an issue for one reason or another, like something wasn't available, I'd probably, probably pick the non-organic on occasion. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, how much protein is recommended for someone that's pregnant? Oh, that's good. I love that question. <laughs> it, 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 it takes, to grow a baby, takes two pounds of protein. It takes 60,000 calories to grow a baby. Maybe 80,000. Just depends. 80. On you always told me 80. For every, every 80,000 80, 80, calories. I'll never forget um, that. Number. It takes two pounds of protein, 80,000 calories. I mean, they're not much. They don't like this big. Doesn't take much. You, 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 it's impossible to design a protein deficient diet for a pregnant woman based on starches, vegetables, and fruits. Never happened. You know, how many, how many people have, have walked this earth? You know, the last correction that I got from a professor who studied this was there are a hundred, a hundred billion people have walked this earth. I have, I, I, there's never been a case of dietary protein deficiency when there's been a, an adequate amount of food available, ever. Pregnant, not pregnant, young, old, you know, once you change your diet from breast milk to, to people food, starches, vegetables, and fruits, you know, that's the only basic change in diet that you need to make for the rest of your life. You know, you, as you get older, they tell you you need to eat more protein because of sarcopenia or other kinds of silly stuff. It's not true. Tons of protein. Well, how, how, how much, much protein is in breast milk? 5%. 5% of the calories are in breast milk. So, uh, let's say a baby consumes 1,300 calories a day. 5% of that would be what, six, six, uh, oh, do, six, 60 calories divided by four. That would be 12, <laughs> 12 grams of protein. Okay. Yeah, you can check my math. <laughs> I think it's 12 grams, but it's not much. Not much. You know, I, I like to look at um, protein and carbohydrate and fat in terms of percent of calories. Why? Well, Mary eats 1,400 calories a day. I eat 2,200 calories a day. And so, you know, just based on the fact that she eats less food, she's going to take in less protein, less fat, less carbohydrate than I do. But the percentage is the same. That may be too deep for you. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> the percent is the same. This is not a math class. It just, you have to just stop and think about it for a minute. Human beings have lived on this planet for a million years without a dietitian or a dietetic handbook. The only thing that they faced was pure starvation. You know, unless they moved to the extremes of the environment like the Inuit Eskimos, where they suffer from protein poisoning because of all the mammals and fish that they ate. But otherwise, you know, this has been a very successful experiment the human being has. So is the rest of the planet. I think we ought to keep it. I like this place. I'm gonna, I'd like to stay here for a few more years. So we better take care of the planet too, I think so. Absolutely. Okay, next question. This is from A. Does the start solution work for candida? It does. 
But you know, Heather, this whole candida thing, it, again, you know, I'm, lo I'm looking at uh, a medical career that goes over, well, about probably 55 years, is that people don't feel well. Uh, they don't feel well because of the food. They're sick. And uh, this particularly is an issue when it comes to women. And uh, I have to believe it's because of the male uh, biases that we have, you know, the gender biases. Is we don't treat women very well. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But uh, back when, uh, uh, particularly a woman, because maybe she's more willing to express her complaints, she doesn't feel well. We, we would tell her different reasons that she didn't feel well. One of the things that we started, when I first started my career, is we told her she was neurotic. It's all in her head. She needs a tranquilizer to solve her irritable bowel, et cetera. Okay, well, when that didn't pan out with the tranquilizers, and people got sick of that explanation, then they said things like, well, you've got hypoglycemia. Okay, and, and, and one of the other excuses is you have candida. So these are just excuses from the fact that you eat the wrong diet. The nice thing is, is hypoglycemia is cured with a healthy diet. I don't know that neurosis is cured with a healthy <laughs> diet, but but if you end up if you if you do really have a candida problem, which are except in very sick people, people are on cancer chemotherapy, strong antibiotic regimes, et cetera, they're not going to have candida. But say you did have a, a propensity to candida, you thought this was your problem. Just eat a starch-based diet. Improves your immune system, lowers your total body sugar, which, by the way, these yeasts love to eat. There's a sugar. They love it. And fix the problem. Yeah, I know you feel bad. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you feel bad. <laughs> Be, but it's because of the food. So just fix the food. Give me 12 days. Give me 12 days. And I will prove it to you for no cost at all. Again, the program's free on our website. It's no, no holds back. Or, you know, you can come to spend 12 days with us and we'll give you the help you need. Get you off the drugs that you don't need. Give you the support that you do need. You're okay. You're you're a good person. You're, you're intact. You're, you know, life's tough, but you're still a good person with a good body. It's just you're playing the wrong set of rules. And, you know, I'm, I'm up to challenge anybody on this issue. Just prove it to yourself. Like so many, I hear, you know, I, I hear through, even though you're reading the comments, Heather, I hear through your comments that people are discovering this and finding out it is true. That it's just something really simple, easy to explain. It's the food. It's like if you took and you took your kitty cat and you tried to raise your kitty cat on baked potatoes, you'd have a sick cat. And you could take it to the veterinarian and you could have the veterinarian give it the most powerful drugs in the veterinary medicine field. And that cat would stay sick until you did what? You could call your kitty cat neurotic. You could tell your kitty cat he has neurosis or hypoglycemia. Until you fix the food of the cat, put him back on the meat which he's designed to eat, you're not going to cure the cat, cat's problems. You're sick because you're, you're eating a diet full of food poisons. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes four to seven days before you start getting better. Do you have four to seven days? <laughs> well, in 12 days, I assure you, in 12 days, we'll have you thinking completely different about yourself. You will realize that you are a good person with a good body. You just need another set of rules. And we're going to start, when are we going to start that next program, Heather? May 5th. May 5th. And in the meantime, we're going to be here Sunday, every Sunday night. Open 5 to your friends. Pacific. 5 p.m. Pacific. And we do this because we have fun and we love your questions. And we really hope we can help some people. At, le at least give what we have to say a serious thought. And certainly give it a try before you go see the people who are pushing drugs and excuses and devices and surgeries and so on. Not that these things can't be of value. I'm a board certified internist. Good grief, I know this stuff. But the problem is the food. Okay, thank you, Heather, as always. That's great.
All right. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. That was great. We got to a lot of questions, so I appreciate your, your speediness. If, if <laughs> folks would rather have the, the short answer, I will give them the short answer. <laughs> I, I can do either. Thank you. That's great. Much, much appreciated. 